Live video, video is starting. starting. Thanks, Rob. Bye. Hi, guys. Hopefully, everybody. Hi, guys. Hopefully, everybody is uh, tuned in and hear us. If somebody could just send us a quick message so that we know the technology is working properly, that would be great. I can't see any messages, but I am going to assume that it is working. So, uh, Mark, you were going to start with thoughts on the season that just finished. Yeah, as I say, if you can actually, um, it says we've got 70 viewers, uh, it's working. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Martin. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, that's good. Um, yeah, I, last time I, I gave some perspective as regards uh, what was more off field, the fact that we'd gone through COVID and we've had a pitch collapse and all the kinds of stuff that we, the club's been through, which you know, uh, and said that uh, at that time what we also, you know, the club was coming through it, um, okay, we would have had another two million quid in the bank if we'd uh, not had those things. But the reality is that we think that we've probably... Um, that Ashley Brown from Bolton Wanderers here. So, hello, Ashley. Um, we, we, I think, in terms of looking at that, we had to do that and keep the balance if, to what we were doing on the pitch. So, I'd just like to try and give you once again, before we get into the detailed questions, a few perspectives of certainly as I see it on the pitch um, and, and where we are. Um, and this comes from a, a question that I've been asked in, in a variety of different ways. And that is, uh, there was one bold question which says, you know, do you consider the season a failure? Uh, and I'll give you a bold answer to that. No, I don't. And um, do I consider it disappointing? Absolutely, really disappointing because I did think we were close enough to get there and, and to get up. Um, but a few things on that. If you talk about things being a failure, I think you've got to define success. And um, like it or not, it, there are only really four opportunities in the lower leagues to be successful and that is to get promoted out of, um, of, of, of League 2 if you define success as getting promotion because once you get into League 1 unless you're what I call a, you know, a self-sustainable or one of the big clubs in League 1 the reality is you're not really going to be having much of a chance um, absent somebody coming in and funding the club which as I've said before you know, if somebody wants to come and do that um, you know, and if they can, we, they can convince us they can take the club further forward, then we'll let them do that. But the question is, you know, it goes to the whole self-sustainability issue. So, if we just accept that, then you know, if you only got four chances to be successful, equally when you look at it, and it is an issue I'll talk about a bit later on in terms of managers, you've probably got about thirty odd managers who are not successful if it's about being promoted. Um, where I would define success, and it was brought home to me a little bit more when I when I went to the um, the end of season dinner, which I thought then the end of season um, uh, rewards, when I thought that was going to be a really miserable evening because of what had happened, and reality is that it is a disappointment. It's a severe disappointment. We feel we should have done better, and I'll give you some stats in a minute that will, will, will say exactly where it is and maybe contextualise it a bit more. But when I went to the awards, you know, you saw actually the elation uh, when people were scoring goals, and so week in and week out. This club is producing that for people and there's nowhere else on the world that does that. And for me, um, success is really being competitive and being competitive means that we can get to towards the end of the season and we have something positive to play for. Not that we're fighting against relegation, but we've got something positive to play for. And I think in that regard, you know, it is. So I don't let the disappointments become a crisis. I've always said that. And um, I think that we have... Um, as I said, provided some entertainment as regards what we've done. Um, are we complacent? Absolutely not. We had a, I think it was a four or five hour meeting this morning uh, and early into the afternoon on a review of the season to make sure that what we do next season is that we do things better. Um, did we improve over the season? Probably. Um, is there an easy and obvious answer as to why away record was not as good as the home record? You'd be surprised when you look at the the data on that, um, it, it really doesn't look that different. Uh, so we need to look beyond that data and into that, and that's indeed what we have been doing. Um, what I would just like to say is that uh, there's, there's a couple of things, um, and one of the things that, that, that comes back is that 
And one of the constant questions is, what about recruitment? Now, recruitment to me is probably the most important part of the, the football processes. We've been working on this for quite some time, since the 2019 um, close season, which, uh, from which we were determined not to, um, to, to repeat that. I've got to be very careful because I don't want to sort of make uh, to, to criticise players or even the people who are making the decisions, etc. Um, but I, I, one of the issues that does come up, and one of the things I've always been very keen on, is continuity, which we had to fight for when we first came into, into the club, having gone down into the non-league, and then getting that, and then losing that continuity when we went straight up on back-to-back -back promotions. So it is something that people rightly raise as a question, um, and I'll just give you something on that. In 2020, in the summer of 2020, um, we came into that with 10 in contract, two that were re-signed and, and seven that were new. And only Spearing and Vaughan uh, had two-year deals. But we had 10 in contract and we had to sort of rattle that through. In the summer of 2021, for, for this season, um, we only had four in contract. And that's as a consequence of, of letting things run out from the summer of 2020. And the reason for that was, quite simply, we didn't know whether we were going to have crowds at that point in time. As we come out um, this year, um, we've got nine in contract and one that we've re-signed. I'm pleased to say this evening that um, it will shortly be out there, but we've re-signed Kieran Morris uh, on a two-year contract plus an option for a third year, which uh, keeps him with us. Uh, and by the way, with the rain coming <laughs> down here, you'll be pleased to know that our pitch is still playable this evening as we speak. So that's some perspective, I think, in terms of on the pitch. Um, I'll just give you some more other perspective in terms of stats and then I will dip into the questions and see what we've answered and what we've not answered. Um, we've got two points more than last season. Uh, if we had the points we've got this season, last season, we'd have been fifth. Um, and there's 40 years since they introduced three points for a win. And in those 40 years, in our time in the EFL, um, there have been fewer than 10 seasons whereby we've had more points than we had this season. And 77 points was the second highest points total which was required to get into the League 2 playoffs, which is what it was this year, and the highest was 78 points. So, you know, Mickey says we were one win away, we were, and how many times can you see that? So, in terms of looking at it, massively disappointing. Yeah, I was disappointed. Don't speak to me after the Stevenage game. Um, but the reality is, you're not that far off. And behind the scenes, which you know you, you guys probably can't see, uh, you have to be assured that what we've been doing, and today we've been spending a lot of time building on the work that was already done in terms of targets. And so, for example, the data that we introduced early on this season um, informs some of the decisions we made. But ultimately, you still have to sort of have that overlay of you know an experienced football brain as it were and in terms of the staff that we've got you know people say well who makes the decisions today um, we went round uh, all of the targets we went round of the way that you know the club wants to play and that the, the coaches want to play and we uh, there's, a, there's a uniformity as to what needs to be done and who we need to work on in terms of priorities etc so you can rest assured that that, that is something that, that that has been worked on and I think has been part and parcel of the migration away from what we had in the past and we've got quite a lot of younger players playing for us. I think um, we had six players who were 25 or under who played 60% of the minutes last year and half of the minutes played were played by players with less than 100 caps, so not that experienced uh, and we're hopeful that, you know, well, we're, we're, we're positive that these guys will further develop as we go forward next season. One last thing, uh, and then I'll stop and we can dip into some of the que other questions. Um, I just ask you to think about what types of manager you get uh, in League Two and in League One. And the answer is you get two types of manager generally. You get the untried uh, manager who's ambitious. And actually it's short term and they'll move on. You get other managers who are maybe one, two or three jobs away from retirement, enforced retirement probably, and they'll pick up their money and they'll do 18 months with you or whatever and then they'll move on. That's football, that's the phrase that they use. 
So it's quite difficult to get into a position whereby you can get some stability in the club, some continuity in the club. And that's what we've been trying to do over the last few seasons in terms of getting processes that are in the club. We don't want somebody who's going to come into the club, change everything and then go away and leave it. So um, that's one of the things that's been working behind the scenes. Um, today, you know, we had all of the coaches there and the manager and Vaughan and the statistic statisticians. Uh, and you know, there was a uniformity as to what, what needs to be done going forwards. If you ask me what do you want of a Tramia player, I take it very simply and say I want somebody who will bleed for this year, who will close down, who will work hard. That's the, the basis on which you then build the rest of the stuff that you need to play the games you want to play. Uh, and, and on that, I'm going to leave it at that and uh, let's get into some of the details. I hope you can hear us uh, OK. There's a, a bit of a storm going on overhead. Uh, and it's very flattering to see the Bolton and Ipswich fans uh, on the feed. It's uh, flattering that we're of so much interest to them, but there you go. Um, so one question is around the, the dip in form following January, the second half of the season. Um, what do you put that down to? Because we were in such a strong position. Can you put your finger on what it was that happened? Uh, the, the first thing is that that, that that leads to a little bit of the, the, the reason for the disappointment because we actually had got ourselves into a great position. And it's when you look back and you see the, the, the performances. I mean, we were the best in League Two. Um, and I, we, we were also the, most, um, the best goal difference in League Two at home. Uh, and you, you, you look at it and you say, well, actually, OK, and I said it this morning in, 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 when we looked at the stats, let's look at the breakdown of those stats in terms of Lee, uh, away from home and, and also at home. And, you know, the surprising answer that came out, there was very little difference in, in those stats. And so, you know, the stats don't tell you everything. And we, we had anecdotally said, well, actually, it's because we've got a lot of younger players. And you might say, well, actually... Um, some of the players aren't used to playing back-to-back -back continually, etc., and so forth. And, and the answer is, th there was no, there was no real answer as to why it was away from home rather than home from. Because one of the things you'd say is, well, the homers and they don't play away. And, and if you're an old lad like me, you'd be thinking of that and you'd be looking for that. But the reality is, we didn't have a specific answer towards that. Um, there are views as to the way we play and how we should play, you know, further up the pitch, etc. And and I guess that you know, paraphrasing, and there'll be more work that will be done. Uh, that's one of the things that you know, it's the most obvious thing that people could see that we should actually sort of play in somebody else's half rather than in our half, which we sort of addressed but not completely. Uh, and so a higher line is probably something we'll be looking at, etc. And what the coaches will be looking at uh, as we go forward. Now, all the recruitment is geared towards that. OK, so that's kind of partly answered, I guess, the next question, which is what's the strategy moving forward for player recruitment and style of play? Well, I think, I think that's sort of dealt with. I'm not going to go specifically into um, you know, the style of play because that's not for me to do. That's for the coaches to talk that through. I could do, but you're getting an old lad giving his view as a consequence of being in that meeting this morning. Rest assured, the, the guys... Uh, uh, one philosophy in life is better never sleeps and the guys themselves were looking at themselves one of the things you've got to get into players and especially in younger players is consistency and you know it was agreed this morning that consistency uh, in terms of players is also consistency in terms of coaching so it's what actually happens what was quite good this morning was when you looked at some of the things that we sought to achieve like playing the board forward faster and not just get back to front um, but actually playing it forward faster, quality into the feet of the centre forward, etc. And you could see the, ma the, the metrics uh, increase in that over the course of the season. And so the coaching is having an effect. Um, I think the one thing that comes out is because we don't score that many goals, or we weren't scoring that many goals, every game is on a knife edge. And therefore you can look at certainly what I would call th this season splits into three thirds. The last third was very much about, um, you know, we started that and I remember saying there were three games whereby we could have come out with nine points, we came out with one. And that's because they're always on a knife edge if you're not getting ahead. Um, a couple of questions around recruitment in terms of, in the past, how has recruitment been done, who takes the decisions, and with um, Vaughan coming in, 
How, what does that look like going forward? Well, it's always been a collaborative approach, but fundamentally, uh, my, my part in that is to say, you know, have we got the budget to sign the players? And in doing that, you probably look at what your, what your wage structure is within the dressing room, and um, you know, that's more for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the coaches and for the manager and for sort of Vaughan to decide on, on what, what's doable in that regard. Um, but we always have regard to the numbers, you know, so it's quite simple. You actually say, you know, if you've got, if you've got sort of 15 first-team players and you divide that into your budget, you know, roughly what you can spend. So um, if anybody's looking completely out of sync uh, early on in spending for the budget, then you just wouldn't accept it because it's going to leave you short at the other end. But it's a balance. And, you know, just as this morning we went through everything, that, that we went through all of the targets, we, we, we looked at those, the guys came up with how they wanted to play, which players they wanted. And the, the bit significant change from previous years is the extent to which we have data. So, for example, we needed um, in, in, in the transfer window in January, which people seem to, to like, we actually got Warrington, for example, because looking on the data on him, we wanted to move the ball forward quickly. And he's one of the guys who puts the ball at risk by passing it forwards and so forth. And his data came out that way. He's also aggressive and, and, and would tackle, etc. And so he, he fitted the bill, and I think he was considered a relative success. Um, there was, I've seen a couple of questions coming in on the uh, live feed around timing and do we aim to do our, our business early in the window or are we expecting some to be left to the last minute? Do you just want to explain a bit about yeah, the dynamics it, 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 of that? It's a good question um, because it is all about timing as life is, you know, do you connect with the ball in the box or not? Um, and, and the timing is important and, and one of the things I'll again give you some perspective if we're in the playoffs every season and you're looking to decide as to whether you're going to have somebody playing in League One or League Two or in the National League or League, or League, or League Two, um, it always makes it difficult because you, you can't really do your... your we, we've got targets for League One or League Two and we've had them since, I would say, March. Um, but once you start talking to players, there's a balance because we've spoken to players now uh, we think that, um, and we wanted to do that, because if you're going to League One or League Two, or you're, you're going up, and you don't know where you are, you're in the playoffs, that takes you towards the end of May. And again, let's just look at Forest Green. Um, you know, if managers, if I come back to that, that perspective, that managers are either in the mould of um, they're ambitious and therefore they want to move on, are they going to get involved in the process to the extent that you want them to? And the answer is probably not. Um, but actually what you do want to do is to make sure that you're already talking to players, talking to agents, etc. So we've, we've, we've been ready to go for some time and uh, as we went to the playoffs, we went. But what will happen now is that it will be relatively early and certain players we talk to come back with ridiculous requests because it's at that stage of the window. If they're in League 2 and they're any good, they're looking to say, well, maybe I can get a League 1 club. So we're actively, we're not sitting on our hands, we're actively talking to these players now and we'll see where we get to. So it, it is a balance, it is about the timing of when, when you get into them and what you can get. You also had the situation whereby if you wanted good loan players, they'd be taken with the first team squad of the Premier League or the Championship Club uh, and then when they've decided not to keep them in their squad for the season, they then become available later on in the window. Um, we believe that with some of the relationships that we've got, we might be able to do a bit more on loan players earlier than normally and so forth. But all of these things are taken into account. All of these things, I can assure you, are discussed on a daily basis. Um, a question here about, the, you, you touched on it in your opening, that last season we had only, I think, four players in contract um, at the end of, of last season. Um, in hindsight, do you think that was a mistake and do you plan to do the same next season? No, I, I thought I'd answered that. The, the answer is no. The, the reason we had the, players in, the number of players in contract in, in 2001 was because of the, 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 the decisions in 2020. And you may recall we had a pandemic in 2020 and we didn't have a clue whether we were going to have any income uh, in the following season or whether we were even going to start. So all of that was shaped by the fact that we had, to, we had to manage that. And I think that was managed relatively well. It isn't ideal from a football situation, but you can't choose to have a pandemic or not have a pandemic. Um, you know, we're back to a similar sort of figure now, which is from the previous season, was having 
broadly the majority of your first team in place uh, and we'll make we'll make you know so we've now got 10 if we've got Kieran in there as well so um, you know we'll build on that uh, and you know we also look at the, the profile of how many are in like the sweet spot of 24 to 28 and you've got to get a balance on the ones outside but you've also got a balance of the ones coming through so you know all those things are taken into consideration when we look at recruitment. Uh, there's a question about budget, playing budget for next year, and how think uh, how you think that will compare to other clubs in League Two. Well, I don't have a full knowledge of, of what other clubs have. Nobody ever does. They always tell lies uh, when they speak to you. Um, the reality is, we understand from what we get out in the marketplace. So, when he's out there, he will get he'll get what the relative prices are. Um, I think we'll be competitive again. Uh, will we be the top budget? Probably not. Because what you find in in any one season, some club will, I hate the phrase, but they'll have a go, as it were, um, hang the consequences of the following season or the following seasons. Um, so you'll always have some outliers who will be um, paying above the odds. At this point in time, the club isn't in the position to be competing with those outliers. If we do some of the projects that we want to do going forwards, the idea is, again, get this balance between keeping what I call um, a relatively successful year, competitive year on the pitch, I'm building, uh, not because I'm an accountant, because it's just common sense, I'm building a balance sheet, getting rid of the debt, but also putting assets in place that will then produce more cash so that the following seasons you can get. I think we've lost two years because of COVID, uh, and once we've um, restored that, you know, with, with these projects when we come on, hopefully that will mean that we will have uh, one of the, the top budgets in there and we can compete with the likes of people who are you know having a go as it were but do this on a consistent basis thereafter uh there's a question here saying can you explain the work that's going on into player development um are we adding specialist coaches and analysis um you know what are we doing um to make players more sellable looking at mk dons and luton clubs like that and how they deal with it yeah, we, we've been going through a process of changing our, um, our academy system, um, partly because, I mean, I can spend a lot of time on this one, but um, if you look at the academy systems that are around, um, you, you, we're a category three, so there's a filter at the front end of what you get coming in. And so it's just say for now, and I'm not insulting anybody, but at a category three, we get the third rate players that come in. So category two get them and category ones. We've got loads of category ones around us. So there's a filter at the front end when they say come in at eight. You then invest in them for 10 years. And when you're invested in them, we're doing like two nights a week. They may be doing four nights a week, five nights a week of category one investment. And then you get to the end of it. And so after 10 years of that, oh, by the way, if you, if you, if you discover a star uh, and Kumas's lad was, was a good lad, then they, they can nick and promise and they can take him for 15,000 quid because Liverpool are our friends as opposed to paying us 12,000 quid. You know, so it's absolutely nothing. So you're investing for, for 10 years in this kid. You then come out the far end of this. And is that, a, or, or alternatively, you can get somebody like O'Connor. He's been in the category one system all his life. So there's a front end filter. There's more investment in him. He then comes out from a better games program because they're playing category one clubs. And he comes to us, we take him on loan and we can try before we buy, and then we take him uh, and we take him on a contract, and we, we pay some um, uh, some sell-on fee to to the club concerned. If you then start to overlay on top of that things like if you look at the demographic of Liverpool as a city and the demographic of Liverpool Football Club, they aren't aligned. You know, there's Egyptians playing there, there's all kinds of foreign players playing. So where do those lads go? And the idea is to make us the finishing school for those lads. So we've started that migration into that with certain of the players that you've seen us take. And over a period of time, I believe that will be the way in which we develop players. On top of that, some of what we were talking about today, and I see the three processes, recruitment, development, and management. Management isn't just a manager, it's all the sports science that we put in on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, and we're coming back into it. We've got lots of players that we can further develop, and I won't talk about individuals and how well they need to develop, but that's part of the thing. So, you know, when I was a player, and I still think it happens to a great extent now, you used to go home after you'd finished training and nobody developed. You know, they came through in the academy to a certain level and then they stopped development. 
So it's a big feature of the way in which you know we're trying to develop players, and I think we have a sweet spot here on Merseyside and with the club that we've got to be a great platform that will persuade players to come to us rather than you know staying in the under 23s and, and so forth. Um, we've got a question about pre-season friendlies, and I can see lots of questions coming in and saying, "Can we have a, a trip abroad?" In you can if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's a question of, you know, it's all a question of, uh, are you going to fit in the timing of this? Because, you know, we get asked to play a lots of, lots of clubs, to be quite honest, and we can't fit them all in because it's all part of a, a, a predetermined scientific approach to getting the players up and the sports scientists have a big say in that, how many minutes they can have and so forth and what level you're playing at and so forth and so on. So it is, it is you know, scientifically laid out. Um, yeah, I'd dearly love to have... A, a trip abroad but it'd have to fit into the program um, I don't think looking at where we are today that's the case I'm not sure exactly but I think um, I think the close season is a lot shorter this year so it's quite difficult to fit things in because I think it starts earlier mm. uh, due to the World Cup yeah uh, two more questions on the footballing side um, can you summarize three key things you would do differently next season to this season score goals <laughs> um, score goals, um, score goals. I mean, to be quite honest, um, I think playing further up the pitch makes a big difference, and that was the consensus of the coaches. And if you're going to have the players to play further up the pitch, um, you know, I, I think that's right. Um, that will get us more goals. Simple as that. Okay, um, and then one to round off with. What's your expectation for the 22-23 season on the pitch? Title winners, automatic promotion, playoffs, or are you not setting a target? People ask me this every year. I, I never set targets because the club, a club like ours, um, should always look to to be competitive. Should always look, therefore, to be um, promoted. And uh, if we're not, I'm always disappointed. So um, I, I come back to it. I, I said this on the. Um, on the uh, um, the end of season dinner, and uh, it's something that Churchill says. No matter what your politics are, he still said some good things. And and if he said um, success is never permanent, so you go up, you, know, you may come down. Um, failure is not fatal. I, I define failure slightly differently to how it was, um, but having the courage to continue is what counts. And that, that's what football gives you as an opportunity, is to, to go on and do it again. All you can hope for is that we are competitive. And I, my definition of success is are we competitive in the last six or seven games of the season? Uh, and, and do I think we'll do that? Yeah, I think we'll do that. OK, thank you. So um, it's time now Pleasure. to move on to some of the, um, the off-the-pitch stuff, like season tickets, stadiums, kit and, and all the rest of it. So um, I just wanted to do a quick run through of a few off the pitch things that might be um, of interest to people. Um, we've just heard that we have got the Family Excellence Award again, um, which is uh, a nice thing to have. Um, I think we feel that post COVID, we need to step that up another level um, for next season, which we will do. But I believe I'm right in saying we're the only club in the Football League that has had the Family Excellence Award of every year that it's been in the league. So that's something that we're quite proud of and, uh, having um, retained. Also, just a big um, congratulations to the grounds team who did a great job this year. Um, our pitch came out as highly commended. Um, I think it was the runner-up in the uh, category for the best pitch, and that's voted for by the visiting teams and the referees who come. Um, I think it was beaten only by a million pound pitch that was brand new laid in the last close season. So they've done a fantastic job. And I think everybody would agree um, at the end of the season, it looked pretty much like it did at the beginning of the I'll season. Stop you there. Rob, you're saying that agree 100% on playing a high line, hope Mickey gets the memo. Uh, Mickey was there deciding on that's what we do anyway. So, I mean, it was a consensus of all the coaches and everybody when we looked at it. Um, a few other things. Um, most of you won't have seen this yet because you will have bought your season tickets before it happened, but um, after the early bird, the season ticketing system upgrade happened. 
Um, that has implemented a lot of the changes that people requested, a lot of the feedback that we got based on the um, first iteration of the system, which obviously had some issues in it. Um, there will only be about 20 people who have, um, who have actually tried it, because it's the people who've bought their season tickets <coughs> since the early bird finished. But um, if any of those um, have any feedback for us, we would very much welcome it. But it should deal with most of the issues that were raised, and in particular the most significant one, which was that we had made it too difficult for people to buy tickets for others. Um, for friends or family or for casual visitors. It's actually dead simple now, so hopefully you'll find that um, a big improvement. Um, Sorry, can I stop here? Can we ban Breakspear reffing us again? <laughs> Quite likely. We're we have requested that. We're on with it, just to tell you that we didn't just take a line down, and we've actually also, in terms of off-the-pitch reports from the guy, uh, I don't mind saying it now, some of them were blatantly wrong, and you might actually call... Well, I'm not going to say what it is, but you know, there is an ongoing debate on this. Um, kit launch. A lot of you are asking when the kit launch is going to happen. Um, barring any disasters at sea, um, it is due to launch on the 28th of May, so later this month. Um, I think that's the Saturday, and we will share with you some more details around that closer to the day. Um, also, another date for your diary, 17th of July, uh, we are hoping to have our annual opening day uh, and we're putting lots of plans together um, for that, so hope to see you all there on the 17th. Uh, another thing that's going to be changing in the closed season is a change of brewery. Um, we are actually switching from Heineken to Molson Coors. Um, but we will also have uh, German craft available um, in parts of the stadium because it seemed appropriate if we're going to have a fan park with a brewery in it that we should be able to sell that. One of the big reasons for the switch of brewery is because uh, Molson Coors are able to supply us with PETs, um, recyclable plastic bottles, which means that we will be able to serve people much faster. Um, at the moment with Heineken, everything had to be poured either out of cans because you're not allowed to um, give cans out or um, through the pump. So it should be much, much speedier service with the pets. Can I just say that a, a, a few messages have come in about a really key thing that I, I wanted to mention in the perspectives right at the front end of, the, of this. Um, and there's a few people who are complaining about the quality of the hot dogs. Um, that I think we're looking at that. We, we are actually going to come on to the, uh, the, the food later, I'll touch on that. Um, next thing is the community ticket scheme. Um, what, what you may have known in the past is the SWA2 tickets. Um, that scheme will be launching tomorrow um, and the club has agreed to match ticket for ticket um, all tickets donated by the fans. So any that you pay for, we will match um, one for one. Um, a quick uh, mention of the women's team who actually had a great season this year. They finished uh, second in their division uh, and they also yesterday won the Cheshire Cup with some a very feisty performance, some tackles going in that Mark said he would have been proud of. And well, I, I just have to say that the, you know, uh, the lady at the back, number 12, she was as close to Dave Higgins as I could ever say anybody was. It was fantastic. Um, there was a question that came in around um, investment in the women's team and whether we plan to make any more investment. At the moment, our women's team is an amateur team um, and it is run through uh, the community part of the club. Um, I think it's a, it's a slow progression. At the moment, we don't have the budget to turn it into a professional team because there is a massive leap between the two. But what we do hope to do is to be working with the women's team as they've done so well and help them progress by... We're having discussions at the moment about, you know, training at the, the campus, etc. So that's not going to be an overnight change, but over a period of time, uh, hopefully it will. Um, the, the final thing that I just wanted to mention that isn't raised in the questions is around esports. Um, just to sort of let you know that um, esports is something that we've kind of dabbled in a little bit in the past. We are hoping um, in September of next year to bring it in as part of the education offering and also 
um, as something that we do around a community engagement and a way of getting kids into IT stuff generally and, and media. Mark's obviously reading the questions and laughing. Wait till I've finished. Um, we are looking for, if, there, if we have um, any young fans who are really passionate about esports, we need to get um, some sort of ideas and enthusiasm from some of the youngsters. So if there are people out there who are really keen um, in talking to us about it, we would love to get your thoughts and ideas and um, hopefully it will lead to some, some jobs and some business in the future. Yeah, I mean, a, a great suggestion in terms of just on the contact, on the, uh, sort of the, the, the ideas front. Um, Kieran Lavery has just suggested that I ask Graham Frodo if I need a hot dog supplier. I think Graham was the lad who came on the pitch dressed as a hot dog and then jumped in back into the crowd and hoped he'd get away from being anonymous uh, in his hot dog suit. So. Okay, can we move on to season tickets? Uh, a question about how many season tickets have we sold? Um, and the big news Please. tonight ta -da, ta -da, is we've just gone over um, 3,000. Um, so thank today. you for that. So, I mean, that is brilliant support. Um, the question is, how does it compare to previous seasons? Um, and there seems to be a bit of a myth that's going round that season ticket sales are down. And I understand why that has happened. And that is because in previous years, we've launched the community tickets much earlier. Um, and therefore, the figures that we give are both for the ordinary season tickets and the community season tickets together. Um, on ordinary ticket sales um, on their own, we are within single digits of um, the exact same number as last year. So it's virtually um, identical. We would hope through the community tickets scheme to be adding another six or seven hundred um, to that, hopefully even more than that this year, given that the club um, is going to match them. Interestingly, we had a report from the EFL uh, recently, which is actually saying that season tickets uh, sales for the season just finished have been down across the whole of the, the Football League. I think that is partly a coming out of COVID. Partly some people will have got out of the habit of going. Partly some people will still have been nervous about going. But positively, um, numbers of young fans um, buying season tickets is going up, which I think is something that is great for the long term. Um, we've had some questions, not surprisingly, about the season ticket price rises. Uh, I don't know if you want to uh, talk to that, saying, you know, Birkenhead is in the top five most deprived areas in the country. Um, we have put our season tickets up. Um, basically asking why we have done that and is there anything we can do to lower the price? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one because you, know, you just have to look back again in terms of perspective. I think we, we tried to put some stuff out when we um, raised the season ticket prices, but you know, on the one hand, um, you know, people are saying, well, you know, we want a, a top third budget. On the other hand, I think we were second bottom of the football league in terms of our average prices and if you look across um, from I think 2013 to today I can't remember all the stats actually you caught me out here um, but I think that you know, it's roughly the same average price getting into the cop as it is you know, today roughly the same price hardly any um, the season ticket price increase that was put together uh, one thing I'd say about season tickets is we do speak to um, the the trust and the trust and I'm not passing the book at all that um, they uh, with us sit down and really sort of set the prices with us and we we, we tried to keep it so that it, it wasn't something that was difficult for people um, I'm, I'm, this is just one point actually um, where people are very negative on social media so you know we started to um, put in place a scheme that allowed people to pay uh, on a monthly basis and this is a classic so as soon as we put this on a monthly basis and we actually extended it so that the actual monthly hit and people could budget was less but they could still take advantage of the cheaper prices of the season ticket which we thought was you know something was trying to help and address the situation that was then twisted into the, the club's bust you know which, which is really frustrating because a, a you know well being 
arrogant about it. These guys don't know what the intersection of the Insolvency Act is and what its def definition is of being bust. Um, um, I, for them, I would just say, look, being bust is being somebody like Berry or Macclesfield, uh, and, and that's what you should talk about. But in terms of, yes, the, the season ticket prices, when we calculated it, the increase in the prices just about covered the increase in the cost of the minimum wage for our casual, um, casual labour. It doesn't cover any of the other issues that yeah. we've got to deal with in the club. Yeah, and I think I think people might be surprised by the extent on which inflation is going to impact the club this year. Just to give you an idea, our utilities bills um, are expected to increase by £100,000 um, this season. So they will be... Uh, over £300,000, which is a massive rise from where they've been in the past. I think historically they were at about 180000 So, you know, it's, a, it's, it's significant increases. The season ticket price rises um, cover a fraction of the increases that we're actually seeing in expenses. And I think we certainly don't do it lightly. Um, it's something that we agonised about for a long time, but we felt it was the right thing to do. And in terms of where that puts us with other clubs, um, a couple of points, because again, it seems to have become a myth that we're the most expensive club in, in League Two. Um, one, one point of clarification is we look at the cheapest seated season ticket price in clubs compared to ours, because... Um, I think we all acknowledge that if you're in an uncovered standing terrace, then there are some around that are cheaper than that. But um, there are seven clubs who still haven't even announced their season ticket prices this year, and I think that's because they are in the same quandary about how they're going to cope with uh, rising prices. But you look at Exeter, which is a fan-owned club, their season tickets are £430, ours are 376 so they're considerably more expensive. Bristol is 480, more than 100 pounds more expensive. Forest Green 391. Now you look at those and you say, well, they're all clubs that are going up or likely to go up next year. Well, um, it may <laughs> seem to suggest that there is some correlation between, uh, you know, what what clubs are getting in revenue and and how they're performing. But actually, you look at somebody like Carlisle, which in many ways is a similar club in the sense of, you know, it doesn't have a rich fan base. Um, it has a very working class fan base. Um, can I can I just say to Paul Ballard, uh, Palios is out. Fine. Got to find somebody to come in, but we're not here um, if people don't want us to be here. Um, just going back to Carlisle, who I would say is a, is a fairly similar demographic, their adult season ticket is £15 cheaper than ours, but they're much more expensive for kids, for youths and for senior citizens. So in the roundings, um, we're cheaper than them. So that's why um, we price them um, as they are. We think it's the right thing to do for the long-term financial stability of the club. We've never pretended that we have... Um, the means to be sugar daddies and just keep writing big checks every year um, if that's what people want and we don't necessarily think that's the right thing for the long term future of the club anyway because it's a precarious place but that's not what we ever came in Thanks, to Thanks Paul um, New stadium Mark over to you, yeah. um, where are we in looking at viability of a stadium move? Okay, just to settle people down on this one um, you know, I accept, I, 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 you know, I don't know everything, but I, what I do believe, uh, I know, is that if you want to be a sustainable championship club, you can't just stay at Prenton Park. I don't think there's the world at all in terms of the assets around the place to generate sufficient cash or to justify um, staying at Prenton Park. Now, having said that last bit, um, when we get to the point at which a, a move is feasible, then we will debate that. We've already had conversations with the Trust and with Trust, and I accept what they're saying, that we need to look at what staying at Prenton Park would look like, what the cost is, etc. Where it is at this point in time is that, um, you know, I, I just have this, you know, I've done the maths, and I, I, an absent structural change in the industry, which, which may come, and if it comes, we can talk about the, the, the regulator if you want. Uh, if it comes, then, you know, I, I just worry that it, it may be short term. So absent that, um, I think you've got to move from Brenton Park. We've done a, a rudimentary business case uh, for it, which says that it, it should work. 
subject to doing a proper feasibility study. Now, a proper feasibility study call costs a lot of cash, and we're currently debating with uh, the various interested parties as to how that could be raised. Just let's say the feasibility study gets done by, um, say, the beginning of next year. That's the point at which we then start to say, OK, fans, um, it looks like it's feasible to do this. We then have to have a design in of it and, and the costing of that. And that's the point at which we then start to have a sensible debate with everybody about whether we move or whether we don't move. Um, but for now, I think it's incumbent on us as, as stewards of the club to look at that and what I would say is that whilst we all who are fans of the club have invested you know, a lot of memories in Prenton Park, and I probably more than most, you know, because I've kicked people all over that place uh, for many years. Well, that's just since you've been chairman. <laughs> <laughs> not, not since I've been chairman. Uh, you know, I, I, I understand that. Um, but my argument against it is that if, if we're right, and let's say the feasibility study will go some way towards that, not the whole way, um, and that is that you know, if you want to be a self-sustainable championship club, um, you've got to make the move. You've got to make assets pay for you 24-7, and it's a big asset now. Uh, how we fund it is a different matter. I'll, I'll deal with that when we get to it. But if we do, then you know, you've got to give the kid that's born today the opportunity to be a championship fan if, if everything stays the same. So, I mean, I think that's something we debate once the feasibility is study done early next year, because nothing's going to be decided. Yeah, and we there's, will a do. Way, there's a long way to go. And back. we will do. We wouldn't do something like that without mm -hmm. having Absol a, a proper, proper detailed consultation. Um, I'm going to move on to some of the match day um, questions, because to some extent they do overlap with the question of a new stadium. Um, and I'm going to pick up in particular on a couple around the facilities. One is I sit in the Johnny King stand, the facilities are terrible, the toilets are awful, the taps don't work properly and the hand dryers are useless. Um, and somebody also commenting on the Bunny Bell bar. Um, now, just to give you an idea of the state of the infrastructure that we've inherited at this club, we are looking at upgrading the toilets in the legends lounges, etc., and in the recreation centre as part of the upgrading we're doing. To do that, we had to investigate the drains and why we keep getting backups and leaks happening. They came in expecting to look down two manholes. They ended up having to pull up 25. And of those, I think it was 21 had drain collapses in them. That will give you an idea of the scale of the infrastructure issues that we have at Prenton Park. You add to that the fact that the plumbing system that was put in, in terms of the water supply, was essentially a domestic system in a massive um, stadium. It is a huge problem to try and put that right as much as we would like to. Um, we have tried to do what we can. Um, some of the guys from uh, the Trust uh, in a couple of seasons ago um, came in and, and did a programme, but we are limited bar spending millions of pounds to strip it out and start again. Now, if we get to a point where the feasibility study for a stadium move says that ain't going to work, you're going to have to stay at Prenton Park, then attention will focus to, OK, how are we going to do this? Because we do recognise that it's certainly not what we would want to deliver. But um, in the current situation, there is no simple fix to that, bar throwing literally millions of pounds um, at the problem. At the problem. Um, we've got also um, a question on the kiosk food. And I'm going to actually put two questions here together because they kind of illustrate a little bit the dilemma that we've got. So uh, the first question is, are there any plans to change the kiosk catering situation for next season? Catering is an important part of match day um, and it's vastly underwhelming. Um, the next one is the price of the kiosk food is extortionate. I can go to Borough Road and get a pie dinner for £4.50, but I'm expected to pay £3.50 for a pie on its own in the ground. And this is the, slightly the dilemma that we've got. There is, there is a, a trade-off between quality and price. And on the one hand, we've got fans saying £3.50 is too expensive. Um, and on the other hand, we've got people saying that they want better quality. Out of the £3.50 pie, 20% of that goes on VAT, so that's straight down to £2.80. 
it costs us about £1.20 to buy in. So that leaves you £1.40 to pay all the staffing, the utilities, the premises costs associated with it. So it's not, um, you know, food margins are fairly standard across the industry. They don't vary very much. So partly we need to be driven by you guys on would you rather have more, a slightly higher price and better quality? Um, sorry, my dog's trying to join in the conversation here. Um, but we are planning she on making some dogs. changes. We are planning on making some changes, um, in particular around the variety um, of food that is offered, uh, and in particular in those stands that have got more than one outlet. What we want to do is introduce more variety. Some, um, I think, I think it is a fair criticism that our. Um, our food is maybe a little bit oh, old-fashioned, sure. so it'll you will see a change going forward, um, and hopefully that will be appreciated. But actually, the volumes of food that the kiosks are selling is the highest they've ever been. So um, it, it is actually it, working well from that point of view. Yes, I think Michael Duff was just asking. Apart from COVID, are you happy with the long-term plan is working out? Um, there's a few things that I've not mentioned. I mean. I mean, broadly, we have um, three big projects. I have four big projects that I deal with on, on a daily basis. One is, is looking at the new stadium. And as I say, don't worry about that. There'll be lots more water under the bridge before that ever becomes anything that's a, a, a semblance of a possibility. Um, the second thing is, of course, the, the football processes, which have been working on now for just over two years as we start to change the recruitment, development and management processes. and. That's an ongoing thing, it, it, it never ends that. Um, the third thing is looking at the constant search for equity, which um, we constantly talk to people who potentially could invest. Uh, we turn down more than, than um, you'd be surprised about, and that's because we just don't think they're the right people, and there's lots of things going on in that area that um, we just have to be sure that, that, that it's right for the club in the long term. There's no point in us spending eight years, and I can't believe it's eight years, but it's eight years here doing this. Uh, and the fourth one is, is probably a little bit more um, current and, and you're likely to see movement on that and that is about developing the campus training ground uh, and putting in more 3, 3G pitches and, um, and stuff around that. So that development, um, hopefully in the next two months, three months, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's a major feature of getting us into a position whereby we can generate more cash uh, in the long term. When will that come on stream? You know, with a lot of hard work, maybe in the middle of um, 2024. Sorry, we need to rattle through a few yeah. fairly quickly. Um, some comments over the issues we had with the behaviour of unaccompanied youngsters during the season and whether we need to have a more segregated area or should we close the lower cop. Um, I think the answer to that is we would close the lower cop if we absolutely had to. We don't want to because being close to the pitch is what supporters like. It generates a great atmosphere. Um, it's not impossible that we may ban youths from there if the problem doesn't um, get under control. Though the last few games of the season where we made some changes to the way that we steward there, um, it was much better. So hopefully that will carry on into the new season. Um, a few questions on kit. Um, I've dealt with when the kit launch is going to be. Um, there's a question about the quality of the kit being questionable this year. Um, I think we would agree with that and Mills would agree with that and they've accepted that. Oh, I hope you can all see me okay. Our screen is going bananas at the moment, but hopefully it's working for you. Um, the, there were issues with the kit this year. Partly it's a learning curve um, uh, for Mills. It was massively impacted by COVID. They had to switch factories halfway through production because of COVID issues and, and various other logistics. So we have had some nightmares, um, but we believe that we solved them all for this year. The proof of the pudding will be in the eating. You will get to find out on the 20th, 28th of uh, May, but we believe uh, any issues that there have been are resolved. Um, somebody saying, can we do um, long sleeves uh, version if it's financially viable? I think the, the issue is, is it financially viable? It's just a question of volumes. It's obviously cheaper the more they're producing of the same garment and if you split it. Um, but if there's, a, if there's a big desire for long sleeve versions, then let us know and we will look into it. 
Um, and then there's a question from Gary Markham around um, why do we do home and away kits every season and isn't that an unnecessary expense for people? Um, a couple of points on that. Um, first is that our away kit becomes our third kit for the next season. So if you want to buy a kit that will remain current for two years, you can do. Um, so that's what I would recommend you do if that is important to you. Um, the second is that most football tops get an awful lot of wear because most fans wear them to every game. Most kids wear them pretty much every day of their life. So actually, for a lot of people, they don't last um, more than a season. Um, and with the move to mills, it has enabled us to drop quite drastically the cost of the training wear and also introduce kits for six to seven year olds um, which are much cheaper than previously because they would have had to buy individual items we did put the prices up two seasons ago that was the first time in 20 years um, that prices had gone up and we still are um, amongst the uh, cheaper in the division our shirts are 45 pounds um, if you buy, go to Liverpool and you want the, the same shirts as the players wear, which is what we sell, um, that will cost you £90. If you ask me what a Tramway player is, I like Tramway players wear long sleeve shirts. <laughs> Simple as that. So I think that's kit in a... In a um, so we come to some uh, miscellaneous ones um, around uh, the new fan park, update on the new fan park. A new fan park, is, is, as I say, it's been driven by the trust principally, and uh, you know, my view is that it, when it happens, uh, it will be good. Will it happen? Yeah, well, these things have been moving on with it. I don't know whether you know there might be a bit of slippage in the time and the dates, etc. But fundamentally, you know, it, it is something that will add again to uh, the thing. The, the, the one the, thing the I'll belief is still that it will yeah. be up and running for September. That's the, very much the, 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 the one thing I'd say through all of this, it, it comes back to you know, basically what I was trying to say at the start of things. There's lots of things in here that we could spend our time dealing with. We could put cash to this or cash to that. It is about getting that balance. And the big, the big priorities that we've got is making sure we can keep the club um, improving the club in terms of off the field, in terms of assets and, and, and um, getting rid of debt and at the same time keeping the balance of keeping the competitive squad on the field. Now, it isn't to everybody's liking, we can't do everything, you know, we can't fix the hot dogs necessarily. We, we can fix the hot dogs, but you know, at the end of the day, there's a whole host of things around the club uh, and we do try our best to, to make sure that we get the balance right. You know, if you're looking at me, I, I would say, what do you want? You want a win inside, yeah. That's that's the main. And would you put up with hot dogs if you didn't have a if you had a win inside? Yeah, you would. So you know, it, it's a question of priorities. Life's about priorities, and and that's what we try and do. And we try to take into account all of the the insights that you give us because it does affect us in terms of what we do, uh, and we try to address it. And there's a lot of good people working at the club that that do this day in and day out, day in and day out. Uh, and I think one of the things that's the strength of the club is it, it, it tends to be, and if you look at some of the other clubs, I I, I always see it through those tinted glasses, but I see it as one club, and I've always said the fans are the club, and at the end of the day, we're the sort of the corporate entity, you know, we're the custodians of it at this point in time. Um, but I think you know, as we come, we're a minute past seven now, so I'm just saying what I want to say. You know, we we we, we thank you for everything that you you've done. The support you've had, the reason we got through COVID was partly because of the support that you gave us. But it's equally about making priorities. You know, it's about having the fact that we didn't have, you know, the squad that you'd want to have consistently in place because we were protecting the future. And I think that's important to note. There's a few people on here who have recognised that. Um, and our oh, dogs again, sorry and you miss Norwood. Now I understand all of that, but just take it from me that there's a lot of people working behind the scenes um, to do the best for you guys, to represent you as best you can, as Mickey says. Uh, and I think that, you know, I, I can't say more than that. I just want you to know that... Um, what? <laughs> there is, there Mickey is an awakening moment that, that, that Mark and I don't spend trying to do the right thing for this club and make it better. You may agree or disagree with um, with what we do, but 
Um, I hope the one thing that everybody will yeah, no, believe is that we passionately have the best interests of this club at heart. And that's your prerogative. I mean, I said um, very much when we first came in that you, you are a custodian of the club. And mixing my metaphors, you know, you're also, it's almost like being in a relay race. You take the baton and you want to hand the baton on further up in terms of field position than when you got it. And I think we're there at this point in time. I think we are further up. You know, have we finished? Have we, have we breasted the tape? No, we haven't. Uh, is there more that the club can do? Yes, there is. Um, but I think we're in a better position than we were in 2014 in, on August the 9th when we took over the club. Uh, and that's, a, that's not just us patting ourselves on the back. That's a combination of a lot of people helping us. And, you know, if I, if I look at it going forwards, you know, do we, do we stay? Yeah, we'll stay until the jobs, until we pass the baton on to somebody who can take it further. And, and that's what we'll do. Um, but, you know, I, I, just, I just ask you to, to have patience um, because patience is, is one of the biggest things in making things happen. Uh, and if you talk of leadership, I think one of the biggest and, and, and hidden things in, in leadership is patience and understanding that you can't have everything all the time. Thank you. We have come to an end. In fact, we're slightly overrun. Um, we didn't quite answer all the questions because we've run out of time. Uh, what I might look at is whether we can pick some of them up that we haven't answered, maybe in a, in a written piece or a recorded video piece yeah, um, later. But thank you to everybody for your support. Thank you for the... 3,000 of you have already signed up for next season um, and, and thank you for tuning in this evening. Yeah, and I'm going off to have the hot dogs now that we've got left over from the end of the season. So, <laughs> cheers. Thank you. Thanks a lot. To the naughty girl.